<laughs> We're so excited to see you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Um, so I was just letting everybody know uh, about the book. I didn't tell them the synopsis. I'm going to leave that to you to let them know what it's about so you can say it in your own words. But I was also filling them in on how amazing Homegoing is and to basically a Bible of books. <laughs> well, thank you. They're very different, but I think there are a lot of themes in common as well. So if you like one, hopefully you like the other as well. Yes, and your writing is beautiful. Your prose is just Love it. Um, I feel like I'm just basically just throwing all these, <laughs> these compliments at you. Um, okay, so do you want to tell everyone what uh, Transcendent Kingdom is about? Yes. Uh, so Transcendent Kingdom is about a woman named Gifty who is getting her PhD in neuroscience at Stanford University. And she studies something called the neural circuitry of reward seeking behavior. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Um, basically, she studies addiction and depression. And it's at a time in her life when her own mother, who is suffering from depression, comes to stay with her. So she's taking care of her mother, she's working toward her final thesis, and she's also reflecting back on her childhood particularly the years that led up to her beloved older brother, Nana's passing from a heroin overdose. Um, so it's a book about mother-daughter relationships, about sibling relationships, about faith and science and immigration and blackness and just everything you can imagine is in this book. <laughs> now, what are the, because some people, you, well, I think you can agree that the books are, are two very different books. Um, structured differently as well but there are some similar themes you have family and connection um that kind of thing but what are some of the themes that you want to explore in transcendent kingdom that you didn't explore in in your first novel mm, i really wanted to explore religion in transcendent kingdom um I, there's a little bit of religion and homegoing um in aquia's chapter but not as much um so transcendent kingdom is looking at evangelicalism and its effects um, in Southern communities, in the Black community, in immigrant communities, um, and that's, I think, a shift from the first book. Um, there are also, obviously, lots of different family dynamics and homegoing, but in Transcendent Kingdom, I really zoom in on the mother-daughter relationship, so you get to feel Gifty's relationship to her mother. Um, they're kind of the ways that they relate to each other, the ways that they don't relate to each other. Um, this book is in the first person, so it's from Gifty's perspective. So I'm allowed to have a lot more kind of intimate exploration through this book than I do with Homegoing. Um, and that was one of the pleasures of writing it as well. Um, but yeah, I'd say the main difference is the, the focus on faith and the contemporary setting. So Homegoing spans 300 years, roughly, and Transcendent Kingdom is set in the present. It spans mo at most 30 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And someone just said one, uh, too cool for middle school, uh, she, she said that uh, she'll never get over Nana, and I, I felt the same. I thought that because... It's not a spoiler alert, you guys. Nana passes away. It's her big brother. And um, it's not a spoiler. I thought that I would be saved because I knew going in, okay, it's about a girl whose older brother passes away. And then, you know, that's part of it. But because you structured the book in the present and then going to the past and going to these very poignant moments in the past, I fell in love with her brother. He was such a great big brother. Mm -hmm. Such a shining light. And it was such a shame you know how what, what ended up happening um nothing gruesome you guys or anything like like that um i, I always try to be careful because we, we deal, deal with so much black pain and that can be <laughs> so hard just in real life dealing with that so it's nothing graphic or anything like that it's, it's again it's overdose um which is graphic but not any violent uh, right. not a kind of death kind of thing but you come to really love him and um i was really i don't know you just like like in real life you love and then you're angry like i was angry at their father I'm like, hey, you did this. And then I'm like, yes. But then you have to understand what it was like for him as a very tall, you know, full of life black man coming and being accused of shoplifting all the time, understanding what it is to be black in America. And you did such a great job of creating so much empathy mm. for every character that in a situation in which it would be easy for the reader to vilify the mother or the father, you know, um, you made it really difficult to do that. How did you really balance out? How did you really create such rounded characters, I guess, and yeah. creating 
Well, thank you. I mean, I'm glad that they that they felt fully rounded to you. That's always the goal for me as a writer. Um, I think a that I go in thinking I don't want to judge these characters at all, even when they are making mistakes, even when they are behaving poorly. Um, and there's plenty of there's plenty of points in this novel where you wish that someone would do something differently than what they do. Um, but I didn't want to judge them, and I didn't want Gifty to judge them either. You know, I think that she she had to kind of remain open in some ways in order for these characters to be able to live out their lives. Um, it's a book that is really considering what it means to continue to make a life after loss. Um, so Gifty herself, I was thinking of as a character who's formed by these three major losses. One is her father, um, which is like a physical loss. He goes back to Ghana. Um, the second is Nana, which is also a physical loss because he passes away. But the third and the one that's like harder to, to identify is her mother who is there physically, but in a lot of ways like emotionally absent. And so the way that I was thinking about constructing these characters is thinking about how Gifty herself is keeping their presence alive even when they are absent, even when they're emotionally distant or behaving poorly or, um, or just going back to Ghana, leaving the family. Um, she's trying to keep their memory alive in some way. Um, and through thinking about her and how she conceives of them, what their relationship looks like, particularly with Nana. They have such a loving and open and, and um, responsive relationship. I wanted to keep that at the forefront. And I think that's how I started to create empathy for these characters. One of the things um, actually Vaughn James asked uh, regarding Gifty's mother is that when she goes to Ghana and she's visiting, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, she goes to Ghana at, at a certain point um, to stay for a little while and she meets her aunt and um, she sees a woman full of life. And his specific question was, as Gifty leaves Ghana, she sees in her aunt the joyous at ease woman her mother might have become. Do you think her mother would have been happier had she stayed in Ghana or would she have been plagued by regret for not having followed her dreams of going to America? Yeah, that's such a good question. And that's such a heartbreaking moment in the book is when Gifty is realizing that her mother could be this happy and that something changed along the way to make her mother less happy. Um, I think that that's such a hard question to answer. I think that Gifty's mother probably would have been happier in a lot of ways if she had stayed in Ghana. And you see her wrestling with that. There's a moment in the book where she like laments the fact that she didn't let Nana go back to Ghana. And you can tell that she's been wondering if had she let him go back, would he still be alive today? And obviously, if he were still alive, her happiness would, would be full, you know, um, there would be no question of her happiness. Um, but I think that she's an incredibly proud woman. And because she was the one who wanted to come to America, she was the one who convinced her husband to do that. Um, she has a hard time, I think, admitting that it wasn't working out when he goes back. Um, she really kind of digs her heels in. She doesn't want to go back. Um, she doesn't want to admit that she maybe made a mistake. She doesn't really see how unhappy her kids are in these ways that she's not really used to thinking about um, because of their isolation within this predominantly white community in, in Alabama. Um, I think she's an incredibly proud woman. So I don't know if she would admit that going back to Ghana or having stayed in Ghana um, would have made her happier. Um, it's a hard, yeah, it's a hard line for her to walk, but I think, I think probably she would have been happier. So I have two questions that kind of prong off of this. Um, one, if you felt like she did make a mistake, I think it's, I think it wouldn't be wrong for us to say that this was a bad idea and maybe it would have been better if they hadn't ever come, the entire family. One, what, if anything, are you saying thematically about that as it relates to America and immigration, and specifically mm -hmm. Black uh, immigrants? Mm -hmm. Two, they go to this really, really white, they end up living in this very, very white uh, area. And one thing that um, my parents and I were talking a lot about was how, you know, when certain groups of people come to America, it's 
Like my mom was like, one one good point with Black Americans is that you're you're able to kind of like you don't have to be stuck in an area, right? Of course, there's layers to that because a lot of people are, but by you know economics and everything, but right. the language itself kind of traps you into a space where maybe you could only be around people from your same country because right. the if you don't speak English, it's going to be hard for you to get on anywhere. And then so that's when you cluster together in groups. And there's pros and cons to that. Pros because you have that economic strength and you have that companion, not companionship, what is it? Camaraderie and that community. Mm -hmm. the, the, the con is that you don't do this whole assimilation thing that's always so lauded when it comes to America. And then, you know, we were like, well, the great thing about the Black community is that one could say, yeah, we're able to kind of, we are very American, right? Yeah. But at the same time, because we tend to, we, we assimilate because, you know, for so many of us, we've been here for generations, that language barrier does not exist. In fact, we only speak English. This is the language. We've built the English language. We've, we, we've helped build the English language. We've built pop culture. We've built everything that we're seeing, music, everything. Yeah. Yet at the same time, we are not always treated, especially just institutionally, as full class citizens. Yeah. So... When they moved to that neighborhood, I also wondered, one, was it even a good thing for them to come? And two, would it have been different if they moved somewhere else? Like, you know, in, 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 in D.C., Maryland area. D D well, there were, they were, wait, where were they? They were in the D.C. Maryland. <laughs> no, they're in Alabama. They're in Alabama. Never mind. Sorry, I'm getting things confused. I do that sometimes. Um, that's right, because it was east, east and south. Mm -hmm. If they lived in the, in the D.C. area and the Baltimore VA area or Atlanta, would things have turned out differently? I wondered that too, because I wondered if that was probably a problem. And the church that they went to, I was like, that's part of the problem as well, just because it's, yes. it reminds me of one of those like non denominational churches. And I think sometimes those are cool, but sometimes people feel like it's kind of like this weird, unrooted thing. So mm -hmm. it depends on where, what perspective you're coming from. No offense to some of y'all who went to those. Don't worry, I went to those too where they played the songs <laughs> on the screen. Um, but for someone who, where the culture is very different, it can feel very othering. Yeah, yeah. Even though a lot of those churches tend to be very welcome inherently by the message. Like we don't even forget discrimination on race. We're not discriminating even based on what denomination of Christian, Christian you are. We welcome everyone. Right. And that's good, but sometimes that just means kind of like whitewashing your experience. Yeah, yeah. I said a lot. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to throw all of that at you at once. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try to, to break that down. First of all, I did want to kind of complicate the American dream. I think a lot of the fiction that we read, a lot of the narratives that we're fed in the media is about how you come here, you work really hard, you get your foothold in the middle class, and then everything is great. Um, but we know that story is not always true. Like sometimes you come here, it's really hard. You're working way more hours than you want to be working. You never see your kids. You're dealing with racism for the first time if you come from a majority black country. Um, and suddenly you're like, was this actually worth it? You know? Um, and we see that in, um, in Gifty's father. Like he decides this isn't worth it for me. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Um, and he goes back to Ghana. Um, so there's that. But I think, yes, there's this element of isolation within the isolation. Not only are they immigrants, but they've chosen, the parents have chosen to live in this predominantly white neighborhood and to attend this predominantly white church. And I think, um, just speaking from my own experience, this was a similar upbringing that I had, um, that when you have parents who like aren't used to negotiating race in America because they didn't come from a country where they had to think about that or talk about that um, and they aren't educated in the history of this country, sometimes it's on the children um, to, to lead the way. It's like the children who figure things out first where you're like, wait, this, this thing happened to me. I don't know how to process it. Somebody said this to me at school. I don't know how to process it. You take it to your parents and they're like, huh, what? I've never heard that word before. That's never happened to me before. Um, and suddenly you're having to have these conversations 
with your parents that they should have been having with you or that the average Black American's parents have with them. Um, and so it's this kind of backwards relationship. And you see that with Gifty and Nana, like they are the ones who are really experiencing the microaggressions of this church. Um, on a deep level, and they don't know how to talk to their parents about it, um, and their mother doesn't really see it or doesn't really communicate with them about it. Um, and so you have to wonder if they had gone to a Black church, would their lives have been totally different? You know, would their experiences have been totally different? Um, I think that it would have. You know, Gifty ends up leaving the church when she's older, and she does so for a number of reasons. One is that her brother has passed, and she can no longer, you know, reconcile a loving God with a God who would allow her brother to to, to pass away. Um, but two, I think, is that she started to start. She started to believe things ideologically, politically, that were very different from what her church espoused. Um, and, and that, I think, the idea that the religion must necessarily be conservative is something that the Black church disproves time and time again. You know, the Black church is the religious left in this country. It <laughs> leads with justice, with truth at the forefront, and it still makes space for God. Um, you wouldn't think that when you see the media, like, talking about the religious right all the time. Um, but, but there is a tradition, I think, of justice and faith going hand in hand. And if Gifty had seen that, if Nana had seen that, um, what would their lives have looked like? Like, I think that's the, that's the like underlying question of this book. Mm -hmm. I think I'm so happy that you, you, you brought that up and touched on that because Megan also said that she loved how you approached evangelicalism in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and people do tend to talk a lot about the religious right, the religious right, or this group of people tends to vote right or Republican because of the conservatism and this, and, and I'm always like, I mean, the church has been really big in the black community for a long time, and that's not an excuse, you know. But it's real; it's, it's the religion with the justice, um, and I think that was an Im important note because these, you know, when when people go to church, it can it can come in all forms. No church is the same; just worship is not the same. I remember, you know, I've, I've gone to, to black churches, to Korean churches. I remember going to one church when I was really young, and I was like, I don't know about this one, mom and dad, because it just dropped me, dropped me off. Because I was like, we're talking about the dinosaurs. And she was like, that's just something the scientists made up because the earth is, and I was like, I'm, it's not making, I'm just in seventh grade, but this is not making sense to me. I, I think I'll just go and listen to the other stuff. Yep. <laughs> it was so nice. <laughs> everyone, everyone was so nice. She was like, you know, we don't curse, we just say, fiddly be. And I was like, well, I like that. Or I say, darn it. She said, but darn it is also a substitute for the bad word. So you didn't really don't say darn it either. <laughs> You know, you're right. I'm just gonna just sit here and just like just, just absorb some of it and like the other side can go. But yeah, so it just comes in many different forms. I think people tend to pigeonhole, you know, uh, religion a lot. And, and I was raised Christian, but I don't subscribe to religion now. I'm more spiritual, but I did love how you approached that. And I knew it was, it could not be an easy task writing about faith and science and writing about someone who is pursuing science while also maintaining and kind of still searching for faith or returning to faith. And how did you manage that? <laughs> they're like, uh, like they're over here. Yeah, yeah. It feels like they are in opposition to each other. It feels like they are binary concepts, but for Gifty, they really aren't. Um, and I think the way that I approached it was to think about the fact that Gifty was such a devout child. Um, she was really deeply invested in her religion. She wanted to be good. She wanted to do good things. Um, and she loved the teachings of the church. Um, and when she started to pull away from her religion after her brother's death, after kind of starting to come into her own kind of political consciousness, she didn't just throw away the child that she was, you know, I think she like chose to honor that in some way. Um, and I think part of where it came from is just love of her mother, um, which I, I, I deeply resonate with, you know, I 
I grew up, again, religious, and I remember going to moving from Alabama, where religion um, just kind of coexisted peacefully with every other aspect of your life. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is not necessarily a good thing, but there was very little separation of church and state. Like, somebody could talk about their work life, their academic pursuits, and then also talk about going to church, and it wasn't weird. Um, and then as I started to live in other places, particularly when I got to college, um, it was like really weird to mention that you went to church. Like people looked at you like you were stupid. And I was like, oh, this is a different way of living. Um, and for Gifty, I think anytime people, anyone is critical, anytime one of her fellow scientists is critical of religion, what she hears, what she thinks about is her mother. And she thinks, well, you know, my mom's not stupid. Like, how can you say that? Um, and I think coming from that position allows her to make room for the truths um, and for like the good of her faith to take what take what she needs from her faith um, and use that in her science and not like cast one thing off um, just because it doesn't fit in with her new life. Um, so she's a character who I think is like really respectful of people's spirituality, even if it's not her own, um, she treats it with respect. Well, you know, with, with her mother and, 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 and having that connection with her mom, um, I thought it was interesting too, because one thing that made me wonder a lot about was what is this thing with mothers and their daughters, right? <laughs> mother, not always like her golden, the star, like I call my son. Bear is my, and he finishes the sentence, shining star. I said, that's right. Oh. Nana is her mother's shining star. And, and, and Gifty understands this. She is that whole thing with the miracle berry. Um, you guys remember that you've heard about that thing that you can eat. It's like this thing you eat and uh, it's, it makes everything else taste sweet, even if it's really sour, right? Mm -hmm. That forgot the name of that bear, but I remember it kind of became a thing like a few years ago. Everyone yeah. would eat it before everything else. But I love that example because she also understood the context that her brother was to her and also her mother. Yeah. But what what is it with mothers and daughters? There's always like this push pull and I see it explored a lot in writing. And I think a lot of people try to explore it within their own lives. It's a very complicated relationship. Mm -hmm. Why that is. Yeah, that is a million dollar question. I think there's been so much literature, so many films, so much music, like everyone is trying to answer this question or so many of us are trying to answer this question. Um, I don't know if I have a better answer. I think there's something about like trying, there's a point where Gifty says something like before puberty, she just looked like herself, like she didn't look like anybody. But then after puberty, she started to look like her mother. And there was something really shocking to her about that, about like growing up to fill this mold um, that her mother had left. And so I think that she's a character. And for so many of us who are kind of dealing with mother-daughter relationships, there's this push and pull of like wanting to be our own individual selves, but then also having this example in our mothers um, that we could follow, that maybe we want to follow. Um, so how do we carve out a separate space for us um, given that there's this woman in our lives who, have, who has taken care of us, met all of our needs, um, and been really attentive to us. So I think it's, um, it's just one of the, one of the areas that, that all art will continue to circle because it's a question that never really gets answered. How do you, how do you make your own life um, even after having this, this kind of stalwart example of how to live? Or even become like your own person, right? Because you were exactly. also talking about context. And there's Nana, who her mother is like, that's the one. She could have just only had that child and she would have been good. And then, but, but she, Gifty also realizes that she is loved as well, but in a different way. And she and her brother have like this dynamic that works together as a mm -hmm. unit. Um, but who she becomes, like, let's just say she's who she becomes is so much based on what happened to her brother and her relationship with her mother. And I think it was something with the emotional, emotional weakness. Like when people were asked, why did she go into neuros neuroscience? And they're thinking that you're going into this thing because you're trying to figure out why your brother passed away or what it was about his addiction. It wasn't really that it was because it was the hardest thing. And she yeah. needed to beat the hardest thing in order to like drive out that emotional weakness within her to yeah. become who she is supposed to become. Right. But that is still also creating yourself by using something that's happened to you to become the thing. 
Absolutely. It, it built some other influence. And I wanted to know if you think there are other things other than driving out our weakness, because I think that is actually a lot of people's, you know, that whole rise and grind or pain is just like weakness coming out of your body. All of these motivational things that we say that has to do with weakness and yeah. needing it. Yeah. Who are we then without any of those things? Yeah. Yeah, I think all of that drives our decision making, drives like our, our dreams, our goals. Gifty is always kind of protesting the idea that her brother has anything to do with why she's studying addiction and depression, but we know that's not true. Like, obviously, there's this wound in her childhood that she's trying to address. Um, and one of the ways that she's trying to address it is through just an intense amount of control. This woman is a perfectionist, like on a hundred, like she just wants to control every aspect of her life because there was so much chaos in her childhood um, because she couldn't control losing her brother and losing her father and having her mother um, enter this depressive state. She couldn't control those aspects. And so um, she does use um, she does use this weakness to propel her, um, but it's ultimately, I think she realizes that it's not like, it's not a weakness if it makes you, if it makes you strong, if it like makes you want to seek out truth, if it makes you um, work harder. Like she, I think she like makes space for all of these things to exist peacefully within her life. Um, she also talks a lot about how much shame she feels um, about the circumstances of her brother's death. You know, there's still so much stigma around mental illness. There's still so much stigma around addiction. And she spent years, like, not admitting, not talking about what really happened um, with in relationships with colleagues. Like, she's always really reticent. She doesn't want to say. Um, and I think that that shame... Um, really kind of propels her to some bad behaviors. You know, we see her cutting people out of her life. Um, we see her just being really intensely guarded. Um, but I think the shame has this other side of the coin and it also informs that controlling aspect of her. She never wants to feel that again. Like she never wants anybody to have anything that they can say against her again. Um, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. Um, probably a, a therapist could be helpful for Gifty in that regard. Um, but I do think that she's really motivated by that early trauma, that what she does with her life in the present um, is because she's trying to heal a wound. Um, and we see that, um, but she doesn't always see that. So this is a good segue into, into a question um, Black Chamomile has for you. And she, she was just speaking to this. She says, I'm wondering about Gifty's other relationships because they tell us a lot about her. Were you trying to show something specific with Anne and Hans in particular and the others? Yeah, I was. You know, there's so much literature about how people who have had um, traumatic childhoods in some way, like bring those traumas into their relationships, into their romantic partnerships. And we really see that with Gifty. Um, again, she has spent so much of her life building a wall around the things that hurt, around the places that she doesn't want people to see. Um, she has a lot of trouble being vulnerable. And so when people who clearly love her, who want to draw her out, who want to have these um, intimate relationships with her attempt to get a little closer, she pushes them away. Um, Han is the first person that she doesn't. Uh, and I find that really interesting. I think one that it helps that he is in the same field as her. And so she can approach the conversation about her brother initially by talking about it from this scientific lens. Um, and so I think that allows her to kind of relax a little bit. Um, but then too, who knows, like maybe there's just some other form of chemistry that's allowing her to just loosen up a little. Um, so I'm glad that she finally feels capable of vulnerability with somebody um, but in those early relationships I think she's really demonstrating the fact that she has some unresolved issues some things that she needs to to work out and to think about I um, lo love Kwana since so she just clicked on here and this is this whole conversation is resonating with her because it's very similar to what she's going through in life so we're saying a lot of love to you love mm -hmm. Kwana I know y'all is like what kind of interview type thing she's like a radio show <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> with shout outs, but you know, keep it live, keep it moving here. Um, so a lot of love to you and glad the conversation is helping. Um, when I got to the part with Han later, I wrote down and annotated and I was like, I knew it. And I was so happy <laughs> that little note, but also with Nana, it's, you guys will fall in love with it. I'm telling you, was there any, is there any iteration of this story? Any draft <laughs> vision in which he didn't die? Like he didn't pass away? Or was this just, is this like the story? It was always the story. This was always the story. Yeah, I knew from, from the first word that Nana was not gonna, not gonna make it through the entire novel. Cause we really love him, you know? <laughs> He's just yeah. like, perfect. and he was going through so much. And that part, um, it touched me. So what he went through on that bus when he didn't want to get off, he just realized, you know what? I don't want to play soccer because soccer is him and his dad. That's what it is. It's him and his dad. And he finally, finally understood that his dad wasn't coming back. Yeah. And I was like teary. I don't always really cry, but I get teary. And that's my version of crying. Yeah. And that just broke my heart and the whole, I don't care. I don't care. Oh, and I just also could see the plight of so many like young black men too. Not only the young black men who are dealing with, you know, issues with their dads or their parents, but just in general with like being a young black man. And um, this is not, I, I wanted to share this with you. This is not a question, but I, I definitely want to share this comment with you from Bon James. It's more of a comment. You talk about the lie of masculinity sitting atop the shoulders of a young child coupled with the little interest in the lives of black people. This is a one-two punch combo, along with a myriad of other systematic means of degradation and oppression that entrap so many black men in this country. I appreciated the attention and nuance you gave to this particular narrative. Now that story is tragic, but more tragic is how commonplace that kind of outcome is for young black men today. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Vaughn, James. Yes, yeah, I think so. There's, I mean, this story we we see play out all the time, time in so many different ways. And Nana is so sweet spirited, um, and he grew up too fast. And and yeah, it was it was heartbreaking. And he's only a, a boy, you know what I mean? He's only a boy. But we can look at that with we can look at the characters in this way. Where we can look at Gifty and say she's only a girl. We can look at her mother and say she's only a woman, and and their father he's only a man. There's only but so much you can take and you can handle. And I think everyone's uh, resilience and the, the amount of resilience is, is different. And you can never really, again, going back to having empathy, really blame anyone because of what's happened to them because it's like blaming the victim for their circumstances. Right. Um, I also right. really love the you had in there. I'm not sure if it was a purposeful parallel or not. I was gonna ask you if that was the case, but from the beginning, you know, I remember having the thought, I really wish Gifty would get a different profession because I really don't like how she has to constantly experiment on mice. I cannot stand animal, uh, what's it called, animal testing, right? And I think a lot of people are really interested and, you know, and, and I'm like, well, she understands. She has the empathy that maybe some of the others don't. Maybe it's because she is so um, awakened spiritually, even when she's not talking about church but she understands how you must be removed in order to do this to the mice. So when you, I was like, did you really have to write that? It was because it's so visceral that she mm. wonders if I feel their head, the skull being a little like their head being a little heavier because of the little thing they had to implant there. Yeah. And I was just like, I just really, I, she, she, they have to be able to remove to do what they have to do. But isn't this what human beings have to do to each other all the time in order to commit atrocities, to commit violence, to just simply oppress? We must dehumanize right and I didn't know if that was that parallel purposeful um yeah absolutely you know there's a there's a moment early on in the novel um from which all gets its title where uh Gifty has a teacher who says to her um to her class that human homo sapiens are the only animals who believe that they have trended their kingdom um so like the only animals who believe that they aren't really animals um bringing that back to bringing that back to the animal level like recognizing that we are all um as you abyss would say like continuous with everything this earth um understanding that what 
what you do a tiny mouse is as significant as what might be happening in the life of a human, I think is something that Gifty, um, that Gifty really, really deeply understands because the work isn't just theoretical for her. It's not just that she's getting these mice addicted to ensure just just so she can like um, some theoretical thing. She knows what addiction means on a really lived personal ex experience from a lived personal experience. Um, and so I think she's, she's a woman who's trying to ask these transcendent qu questions, trying to create these parallels between the lives of the things that she studies, the mice that she studies, um, and the lives of the humans um, that, that this study will have deep impact on. I was trying to find what you were just mentioning. I was trying to share with everybody the quote in which you say that. And I, if, if you knew it by heart, I'm not sure, I'm sure, I'm not sure how much you know your, your book by heart. <laughs> I help myself by highlighting every darn thing in here, <laughs> dog hearing everything. I'm like, you did not help yourself when it came to wanting to find these quotes. But the quote in which you say that she's, she's seen, um, not the light, but she's seen tra transcendence she's seen it in the mouth she's seen it and yeah. that's so deep but yeah. so are a lot of things in here which is why everything's dog-eared and why i can't find anything <laughs> <laughs> and i just feel like a big we, we have that where, where religion and uh religion and spirituality and science meet but the level of i, I think when i came away from this novel it so much is about just empathy, the level of empathy that is in this book. Sometimes you can read a book and you can tell like if the author actually cared about that person or not, or maybe they didn't really love them. They didn't really get into their skin in a way that, that the character would be a full human being. Mm -hmm. And the level of empathy here, even with Pastor, um, Pastor John, right? Even with, with him too, I felt, I still, felt like he was a real living, breathing person. Because a lot of what drives him yeah. is, is fear and, the, and, and not wanting to release old things. Right. But there's just so much empathy. And I feel like that is actually something that, I don't know if it's missing right now, well, you know, in the climate of what's going on. And I don't hesitate to say right now, because as we know, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that is, yep. is done. So it, it did remind me though of, where we are now, what they were going through in, in, w with the anti-blackness and the racism, um, dealing with, with Pastor John and the church, or however well-meaning he was trying to be. But one of the things people say right now so much is, um, we are living in, we're more polarized than ever. We're more polarized mm -hmm. than ever. People just don't see the other side. They're not empathizing. They don't even acknowledge what the other side is going through. Mm -hmm. Do you think that things are more polarized now? Or do you think things have just come to the surface? Or are we indeed more polarized? Before? Yeah. Well, I think, as you said, there's nothing new under the sun, uh, especially not that, you know, sometimes you'll see these posts where people talk about how we are more divided than we've ever been. And I think this is a country that's had a civil war. Like we've been divided, like literally divided. Um, and so I think so much of what we are seeing right now is is that that stuff bubbling up, that stuff that is always there that we haven't dealt with. All of the racism, all of the capitalism, all of the disdain for poor people, black people, immigrants. Um, um, this country has been doing all of this. Um, why it's happening, to, why it's feeling as though it's come to a hinge point now, I think has a lot to do with the president, obviously, but I think it also has a lot to do with the way that we share information now. Like social mm. media is so, so different from how people used to consume media. Um, and that, that polarization, the way that Google will like give you um, give you results based on where you live, based on things that you've already searched for. It just kind of confirms that they already believe. Um, like I think that that is in fact making us kind of get into our little zones and stay there. Um, so no, I do not think that polarization is new. I think what's new is that we are having a harder time meeting each other um, in spaces where we can actually relate to one another. And we're having a lot harder of a time getting at the truth. 
Instagram too. Your your explore page used to be a real explore page. I'm sure a lot of you guys can feel me when you used to go to explore. You used to see other things, and now you just kind of like see. It's, you can just see how it's so curated, and you're seeing things that you already saw or in the same group, and you're like, can I see like the, the sky in a rainbow? Can I see some different things? So I, I hope work on that. No one I everyone I know does not like that about the explore page, and how everything is just giving you what you already see. It's doing the feedback loop, creating the bubble. Um, but we we are a nation of um, people from all different walks of life, countries, ethnicities, all of that. Um, Gifty says about her mother that she sees when her mother, she speaks three different languages, right? She's mm -hmm. speaking English. Um, Fanti. Yes. Yeah, see, I, you, you have to let me say it because I wrote it down. Fanti. <laughs> Twee? Is that yeah. Twee? Twee. 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 Yeah. Fanti, Twee, and English. And she sees how her mother is like a different person every time she's, whenever she's speaking the language, she's like a different version of her mother. Always her mother, but a different version. Mm -hmm. So language does do that to us. I'm sure people who speak more than one language, you can tell when you kind of give into a different vibe or whatever it is, that the language touches you in a different way or brings out certain things. But what does that mean in a country where so many people is it difficult for us to kind of get on the same page if you have that? Not, not saying it's difficult for us to get on the same page if we're people from all over, but given the fact that different length, different, even a different, same person speaking a different language can kind of bring out a different aspect. What does that, what does that mean for a, com for a, a country that has so many people from so many backgrounds? Yeah. Oh, that's a fascinating question. I hadn't really thought about that that I think language a lot because I grew up in a multilingual household like my mother is Fanti my father is a Shanti and speaks Twi my father is also a French professor and we grew up speaking French mm -hmm. and then there's the English aspect and when we first immigrated like people used to wonder like if we needed help learning English because my siblings and I like it took us a long time to figure out which language to speak in which context because our, our household was so multilingual um, but one thing that those languages has taught me is that people like the the language also informs character in ways that we don't think about language informs culture in ways that we don't think about there's a moment in the novel where um, where Gifty's father is talking about how in Chui there's no word for half sibling step sibling mm -hmm. um, aunt uncle you just say sister brother um, mother, father, and what does that mean for your conception of a family to not even have the words that like divide into these different groups? Like, I think that's really powerful. Um, so I would love to see like more acceptance of these different constructions, more understanding that there are different ways to see family, more understanding of the fact that culture and language culture and science, culture and mental illness, like culture and everything are inextricable. I think you were too little for this at the time, but like, so what are your thoughts on like back in the day, Ebonics? The whole, <laughs> remember, like, the whole like uproar about Ebonics and is it a thing, should it be a thing? What, you know, there are rules, but I mean, what are, just what are your thoughts? I think I was, yeah, I don't know if I, if I was around for the, for the controversy. <laughs> But it is its own language. That's what I think. I mean, it's a language. It has it has rules. It has structure. Um, it has you know. It has all the things. It has grammar. It has all the things that you, that we expect from other languages. So it is its own language. Okay, that, I just wanted I just wanted you to say because it reminded me of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, could we talk? I know it's we're running out of time, but can we talk a little bit about um, craft as far as just like your your approach to writing um one thing i wanted to know specifically I, I ask a lot of writers is how long did this first draft well no before that you came off the heels of home going i don't know how much pressure you were feeling i don't know how much of this you had already written or if you were just diving in off of that success and when did you begin writing writing transcendent kingdom um, I was feeling pressure after Homegoing. They say that it takes you your whole life to write your first novel, and it really felt that way. And something I think we don't talk about a lot as writers is the kind of sadness that you feel after you finish a book. Like you've spent so many years thinking about these characters, living with them, 
um, working on this book and then suddenly you're just done? Like, where did they go? Um, and so I had this, this moment of feeling like a little bereft, like I missed working on that book. Um, and it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, so I, Homegoing came out in 2016 and I started Transcendent Kingdom in 2017. Um, so it took me several months to, to get going again. Um, and once I Girl, did, I think they it don't was, do. They're like, don't yeah. you try to write that second book after that first book already <laughs> comes out. <laughs> you have to get ahead of that. Tell someone told you that probably, right? So many people told me that. So many people told me you should already have started your next thing when you're working on the other thing so that you don't have that period of like trying to figure out what to do next. Um, I didn't listen. <laughs> I still haven't listened. Um, but I think, you know, there's something also really nice about having like a quiet period, a fallow period, just to kind of empty your mind like that's a kind of work too like we can't really articulate what work is being done in the quiet but i do think i really do believe that like in in the making of art like the silences are as important as the as the words so true so true so mm. when you did you started writing in 2017 how long did it take you to write the first draft and what was your revision process like for this book Okay, so it took me, um, it took me about a year and a half to write the first draft. Um, and I usually like try to not show anybody anything in the first draft. Um, and then after that, I shared the first draft with uh, four people. One is my best friend who's a neuroscientist um, and had been like helping me along the way with the science. So that was really helpful. Um, and then I also shared it with friends um, and once they get their feedback, um, then I start to use that to create the second and third and fourth drafts. And for this book, I did, um, I did the first draft and then I did two other drafts based on friends notes. And then I sent it to my agent and I did one draft with him. Then we sent it to my editor and I did one draft with her. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, what is that? Like five total? Yeah, that's good. That's, that's, that's not, that's not, it's good that you have your critique partners or your, your first readers. That's really great. And then you, you try it up and you, you get it polished before you give it to, you know, your agent and especially your, your editor. Um, yeah. yeah, I just, you know, I, I'm always in awe of everyone's process, um, processes because I, I think that every artist is different and approaches, even approaches different books different ways. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to know too is, well, especially because now you said that Nana was never going to make it. It was always part of the story that what happened with Nana happened. Um, but in general, what, what was your seed for this story? And in general, do you usually start with characters first? You usually have a, I don't know how like much you think about plot or is it more mm -hmm. just uh, the what if question or just maybe voice? What is the, the, the thing for you that gets you started? Yeah, it's been different from novel to novel. So Homegoing was the only time that I've ever had what I think other people talk about is like a stroke of inspiration. Um, Homegoing started because I took this tour of the Cape Coast Castle and I was walking through that space and it felt so haunted um, mm. that I was like, there is, there is something happening here and I have to write about it. Like I want to write about it. Um, Transcendent Kingdom did not have the same kind of direct visceral starting place. Um, it started with voice. Um, I was thinking about that, the sound of this woman who is really academic, but has to, or is trying to relate to her mother um, on, on the level of faith. Um, so that kind of came first. But then the other thing that came first with this book was my friend who is a neuroscientist um, and whose research I rely really heavily on for this book. Um, I took a trip to her lab and shadowed her before I even started writing, before I even knew that I wanted to write about her work. Um, I just mm -hmm. shadowed her in her lab um, and I found that so interesting that I thought, okay, maybe there's some way to connect this with the other thing that I'm kind of thinking about and who knows, but I'm, I'm pretty, I'm not a very planned out writer. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm just kind of fumbling my way through in the beginning to try to see what the story is um and that that early process was so different from homegoing to, to transcendent kingdom 
So are you able to see? I couldn't be her friend because I would have been. She would have came back the next day and be like, "The mice are gone." I'm like, "They are." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> but um, so you said you haven't listened again. Um, is it too early? Is, are we allowed to ask what you're working on now, or are you able to give a tidbit, or just to give a general thing, or to just say you are working on something right now? <laughs> you're allowed to ask. <laughs> what I work I am a little superstitious about talking about what I'm working on, so I'm not going to give you too much. I will just say um, that it has been really hard to write during the pandemic. I know a lot of people are feeling this way, um, and so I've been allowing myself just to read as much as possible about anything at all, um, and I think that I have the seed of an idea, um, and I will see what it turns out to be, um, but... Also, with my track record, I found that the beginnings are so different um, than what, what the novel ends up being, that anything that I tell you right now about what the book is about will prove to be a lie by the time it comes out. So just know that I have faith <laughs> that something will come. <laughs> oh, I don't want like, to jinx it. So, well, I was about to say something really positive, but we're just going to just let it all marinate right now. Um, so you've been yeah. reading a lot. Is there anything before we go that um, you would recommend? Any book recommendations you would uh, love to give us? Sure. I really loved Luster by Raven Leilani. I know that lots of people are talking about that book um, yeah. for a good reason. It's really, really good. It's funny. It's sexy. It's just, it's great. Um, yeah. I also love The Van Path by Britt Bennett. Um, that came out in June. Really excellent historical fiction. Um, so that was great as well. Um, and then I just finished Memorial Drive um, by Natasha Trethaway, who was our former poet laureate. Um, and this is a memoir. Super sad. I cried. I cried a lot through it. Um, so de it depends on where you are if you want to read this book. But beautiful. I've seen it and I've been I'm thinking I, I really enjoyed Luster as well. Loved Luster. Um have not had a chance to read the vanishing half yet. A memorial drive I've seen, but um yeah. I just I've got to dose the amount of black pain I'm able to like I literally just picked up cast and I was flipping through pages. I was like, see, I just I shouldn't have picked up this book today. And I was like, I ended up picking it up anyway, the things that we need to know, but there's only so much you can take at a certain time. You know what I mean? So we have to take ourselves too, but we do need to, yeah. I believe stories need to be told. Um, we have to remember those who've gone through hardships and those who've, who've paid the ultimate sacrifice and they deserve to be remembered and we can't just shut our eyes because it makes us uncomfortable. I do believe that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing those. And thanks for sharing with us this beautiful work of art. You guys, if you haven't read this yet, I know that our conversation has not spoiled you. Check out <laughs> by yeah, Jesse. It's brilliant. Um, I, both books, brilliant. I feel like it's more, I feel bad because I feel like I'm like hyping it all up and I'm, what, what, we're talking about your third book and that's a lot of pressure going into your third book. It's good um, to always it's become a place where people love your book so much that it feels like pressure for the next one. Like, I, I'm happy that. <laughs> you are people's auto by author, though. You oh. are like, auto by author. You know what I mean? Like how Aaliyah yeah. was an auto by musician. If Aaliyah's coming out with yeah. the album, boop, I, already, I already know I'm getting it like that. Oh, so. that's, so, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking the time out to chat with us. And you know, your very busy whirlwind schedule of virtual tours. Um, you guys, make sure you guys check out the book. Someone asked, is it on Amazon? What's not on Amazon? Come on now. Bookstore, Amazon. <laughs> we know books are on Amazon, you guys. Come on now. <laughs> but yes, on, on, or you can go to bookshop.org and you can actually help to support independent bookstores. I like to do that a lot. And I believe that you, I don't know if you can choose the bookstore, but anyway, choosing bookshop.org, you can support the indies. So make sure you do that. And um, again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.